Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Tuesday, November 2nd, 2021. It's my great pleasure to be here with Professor Edre H. Goins. Edre, it's wonderful to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Edre, to start, would you please tell me your title and institutional affiliation? I am professor of mathematics at Pomona College. How long? In the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. And how long have you been at Pomona? I officially started, I believe, June 1st, 2018. So it's now getting through my fourth year, starting my fourth year. And one of the many big questions, of course, after so much time spent at big research universities, why was it important for you to come to teach at a smaller liberal arts college? It was really a sequence of reasons. Um, one, you know, for a very shallow reason, I grew up in Los Angeles. I wanted to move back to California and the opportunity came up. So I decided to go for it. Um, some more substantive reasons were, um, I really felt that I could make more of a difference in the field of mathematics by going to a place where I could train more students to eventually go into my field. Um, being at Purdue, where I was for 14 years, I didn't really have the opportunity to work with a lot of minoritized groups. Um, we didn't really have a lot of underrepresented minorities as grad students. And at Purdue, most of the minority undergraduates were going to engineering. They wouldn't go into mathematics. So I really felt that if I were going to do something to maybe try to increase the number of minorities going into math for grad school, I had to start at a place where I could work with minority students as undergraduates. Pomona has quite a number of math majors and quite a number of those are minorities. The math major is actually the most popular major at Pomona, which really surprised me. There actually are more math majors. When I say math, I mean more generally mathematical sciences, so math statistics, um, what have you, more math majors at Pomona than there were at Purdue, which was insane to me because there's something like 2,000 undergraduates at Pomona versus 40,000 students at Purdue but still, there were many more math undergrads, math students of color at Pomona than the were at Purdue. Edre, so you don't mean you mean second. absolute numbers. You don't mean percentage of overall class. No, I mean absolute numbers. Interesting. Absolute numbers. Interesting. Yeah. What so it, it was shocking. That? What what explains that? Well, that, that's why I wanted to come here. That's exactly why I wanted to be on the faculty. I think that it's it's a series of reasons. Um, one, I know that the faculty here are very concerned with having um, a very supportive department to try to have a lot of encouragement of the math majors. There really is a strong sense of community amongst the students here. Um, there's lots of things like that that I think really causes students to feel very much like they just like being in the math building. That was not the case when, when I was at Purdue. You know, the math building was a place that you had to go maybe if you had some questions on an assignment but a lot of students just did not want to go to office hours. You know, at one point I had a class at Purdue that had over 100 students. Um, no one came to office hours. But still, it was 100 students that I had just in that one class alone. Here, I have maybe two classes a semester. Each class might have between 10 and 20 students. I'll easily get five to 10 students coming to office hours every single week. You know, there's just the sense of, the faculty are really easy to talk to. People want to come to office hours. They really want to spend time in the building. And so I think because of that, the math department in general, and the math major in particular, has a really strong reputation of just being a friendly thing to do. So I wanted to be a part of that just to see what is it that they were doing right. Edre, there's so many questions about terms that I'd like to ask you. The first, most of them are going to be in the in the world of mathematics, but the first, as it relates to diversity issues, the unique term as you used it, minoritized students, as opposed to minority. Can you explain your use of the term minoritized? What does that mean to you, and where do you see it in historical context? Well, I realize that there are terms that have different meanings that have changed over the years. Um, you know, underrepresented minorities, student of color, person of color. Nowadays, there seems to be popularity of using BIPOC, you know, Black, Indigenous, person of color. Um, in general, with a lot of those terms, the idea is that there is a small group that maybe has had historical injustices 
imposed upon them. I think there is a growing trend to kind of go away from using terms like underrepresented minorities, more because it has the stigma of these are students that maybe can't cope with the situation that they're in. They're suffering from things like imposter syndrome that you have to help them because they may not survive otherwise. All of this really falls under the guise of like a deficit mindset, you know, that these are students that can't make it. So you have to kind of baby them, hold their hands to make sure that they'll be okay. Minoritized groups implies this idea that maybe they are smaller in number based on the situation that they're in. You know, if you have, let's say, groups of women in a classroom, I believe nowadays you have something like maybe 60% of the college students nationwide are women, but typically in mathematics, you might have maybe 10 to 30% of the students in a math class. So it's not really fair to say that women are a minority in college, but you can say that perhaps they are a minoritized group when it comes to a mathematics course. Um, I don't even wanna use the term say, either historically underrepresented because it's not really clear what that means and kind of what the statements are there. So when I do use minoritized groups, I am thinking of more like an active way of thinking of why the students may not be in my classes. So for example, I might say that black students are a minoritized group because perhaps I'm not doing something right to make them feel comfortable in my classes or in the math building. Um, so definitely when I use minoritized group, I am thinking the historical terms of underrepresented minorities, also let's say women, but these would just be groups more generally that may not feel comfortable doing math. And I am actively trying to ask the question, why don't they feel comfortable doing it? So that I can hopefully change things. Edre, would, would the term minoritized connote or should it, or even should it not connote that, and I don't know how this works grammatically, minoritized is something that is externally being put upon these groups. I think that's a fair way to say it. Yeah, I think that that, that is definitely a good way of, of thinking of it. Um, certainly, there are some groups that, for historical reasons, may not be in STEM more generally. Um, and this could be lots of reasons. You know, for example, um, women may not feel comfortable majoring in mathematics, being in engineering or, or what have you. But, you know, of course, there's this growing trend of looking at women when computers first came out. You know, this idea of women as human computers. And my understanding is that back in maybe the 20s and 30s, back when computers were really starting to come out, not the digital computers, but really having the need of having just a core set of people that were willing to do computations, that was primarily women who were doing the work. Something happened over the years that this idea of computers eventually translated into something that only men do. And so, you know, so there, if I want to say historically underrepresented, I don't know if it's fair for me to say that women were historically represented in computer science. Something happened that they became a minoritized group. So I do think of it as like, you know, an imposition on that group in some way. Edre, we'll talk much more about this, but as a bridge to your career in mathematics, at a very basic level, to understand your motivations for increasing diversity and inclusivity in the field, where is mathematics a refuge for you, where you don't have to worry about the negative side of humanity, about racism, about hatred, about exclusivity, and where is even the nature of that question naive because there is no such thing as a refuge. How do you understand these things? I would definitely side more with the latter that if there is no refuge, I certainly don't consider mathematics to be a refuge at all. I think maybe when I was younger in a very naive way, I thought that it was going to be a refuge, you know, that it was a place where it was just all about the mathematics that you do and it was all about the equations. But I've realized now that there are people doing the mathematics and people have their own flaws. And in trying to kind of get your mathematics out there, get it recognized, get it understood, that has to go through a human lens. So I do certainly understand that you have to be aware of that when, when you're doing math. When I was in grad school, I, I had a joke with my friends that I called myself the Black mathematician to try to really emphasize that those aren't separate things. You know, I can't be a Black man in America and be a mathematician, that I'm both at the same time as contradictory as, as that may sound and as that may feel at times, 
that's just who I am and the way that I'm going to have to work through the world. Um, I think when I was an undergraduate, I became very interested in mathematics for a very selfish reason. I didn't think of math as maybe a way to solve the world's problems or to help out with the community that, that I grew up in in Los Angeles. I really just did it because I liked how pretty the equations were. I eventually came to the realization that a lot of the biases that I would see with people walking down the street, going into the stores, were amongst the mathematicians that I was working with. You know, still dealing with racism, dealing with people that have this historical notion of it's really just like an older white male that can do mathematics. Really, nobody else can kind of fit into that mold. When I started to see all of that, that's when I realized that I do have these two that I have to worry about working together, you know, being a black man in America and being a mathematician. Now, when I do mathematics, I think of the two of them as together. Whenever I work with my students, I don't just think of this as they're doing mathematics as this thing where it's just a very intellectual pursuit. But I certainly see it as there are humans that are doing this mathematics and the humans doing the math are gonna have to worry about the biases that they get from other humans that they work with. So to me, it's all together. You know, you have to kind of work with the whole package. Edre, to clarify, when you say there's no separating being a black man and being a mathematician, can that be universalized to say that even if you're a white man, you might not be aware of it, but you also bring your own biases and uh -huh. culture to mathematics? Oh, yeah. Yeah, most, most definitely. Um, in math nowadays, there's a term that's being used more and more. It's called humanistic mathematics. Um, it's a term that was originally put out by Rochelle Gutierrez, who's at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. It's a very simple concept. The people doing math are humans. And if you are going to consider doing math yourself as a career or even in class, you have to think about the humans behind who's doing the math. Um, I would say that it doesn't matter if you are a black man, it doesn't matter if you're a white woman, you know, it all comes down to bringing your entire self to the mathematics that you do. That is a very different concept, I think, from historically the way people have viewed math. I'm not going to say that that's different from the way people have done it. I think it's just different from the way people have viewed it. I think a lot of people do view math as this thing that you can do in a room by yourself, just working out the equations at, at a chalkboard, that there is no human component to it. You're just there to work out the numbers and the equations. In reality, it doesn't work that way at all. You know, if you really think about it, science itself is a very communal kind of action. You have to worry about getting your publications out there. There have to be other people that have to referee those papers. You have to present your ideas at conferences. You know, all of this comes down to the way other people view what you're doing. And ironically, when it comes to doing science, science only works because of the scientific method. Other people have to be able to re reproduce your results. Mm -hmm. You just don't sit in a room and do it by yourself. Other people have to agree. Other scientists have to agree. This looks correct. So somehow we forget that we're doing math and science. So I really do believe in this idea of humanistic mathematics now. This is as much a philosophical as it is any other kind of question. In the right. way that we wouldn't think twice in art or in music, that the individual's fingerprint, that their emotions, that their worldview are embedded in their artistic project. For what you're saying, which is amazing, because again, naively, you would think that Math is so pure, it's so objective, it exists out there, whether there are humans to connect to it. What you're saying is that fingerprint, our own heritage, the way we approach the world, that's our only access point to the math, just like our only access point to, 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 to music or to art. Yeah, that's exactly right. That, that is exactly right. Um, you know, I think one thing that's made science really great in the last 100 years or so is taking certain ideas, like say by Einstein, and really putting them into the popular culture. This idea of time travel and relativity and kind of what's happening with, with space time. Um, that I think has really encouraged a lot of people to really think about science in a very different way. But it's still part of this thing of it's, it's kind of getting more people to talk about it amongst each other. It's not something where people just kind of do it in a room in the dark and then, then that's it. Mathematics, I think, will do better as a profession 
if it can find a way to communicate, really to just kind of get more into that popular culture. Like there's certain theorems and results that I love that are beautiful. And I try when I can to kind of explain to other people what these ideas are. I would like to see mathematics in general try to do the same thing, get some of these really beautiful ideas out there, just like art. I've always said, I consider math to be more art than science. You know, I am in it because of how beautiful and simplistic the equations are. I honestly don't care about like practical applications and whether they're going to solve the world's problems. I just love the equations for how beautiful and simple they are. So that's what I would love to do. That's the way I would love to see math eventually go. Andre, I'll use physics as an anchor point because it's a world in which I'm much more conversant. And there's this very important idea, which specifically goes back to last summer and the murder of George Floyd. And that is, it's not just that physics owes something to diversity. It's that physics needs diversity. That if we are going to solve the seemingly impossible problems of integrating gravity into the standard model or understanding dark energy or dark matter, we need at a very elemental level a multiplicity of perspectives because if we just have the same kinds of people attacking the same problems in the same way, by definition, we're not going to make progress. Does that right. basic framework work in math as well, would you say? It, it certainly does. It certainly does. Um, you know, along these lines, um, a good friend of mine, Stefan Alexander, has this brand new book out, Fear of a Black Universe. Yeah. And I've been reading through it. You know, it's really fascinating that he certainly puts out the exact same idea that you're saying here, that physics really has to inverse, has to really embrace a diverse set of views. Otherwise, it's just going to be stagnant. It, it might even die. Math is very much the same way. What usually happens in math is someone comes up with a technique and they use this technique to solve a whole series of problems. And as they're solving these problems, they come up with conjectures of maybe statements that should be true. But that's very much a closed system. You know, you have these techniques, you then come up with these solutions, you have maybe a few more techniques to come out of that, you then have these questions, but then you hit a wall. You can't really go any further. It's almost like the way people in math like to say it. You have a hammer and you're in search of a nail. Mm -hmm. You know, you have this technique that seems to work really, really well, but at some point you don't really get any further. If you have someone who now is working in kind of his own silo where they've done this, they have this technique, they then have a series of problems, and then they get stuck. Once they look in the other person's silo, that's when real progress in mathematics happens. If you take a look at all of the big results that have come out at least in the last 100 years, you can take a look at people who've either won the Fields Medal, people who've won these so-called breakthrough prizes. They've all worked, they've all been successful because they've tried a technique from a completely different set of problems in math. Somehow they're using this diverse set of ideas that has to be introduced in a brand new setting and then it works incredibly well. Um, we in math know that. You know, we certainly do understand that once you have this diverse set of ideas, that's when the progress happens in mathematics. But for some reason, that still hasn't completely translated into maybe this means that we need to have a different set of people working on the problems, not just the new set of ideas, but perhaps individuals that are coming from different backgrounds to also introduce these new ideas. I think it's going to happen eventually that the people are going to see that it's not just about the mathematical techniques. It's also about the humans doing the math. It's going to cause math to realize that we do have to diversify, much in the same way with physics. We definitely need to have a de different set of people. Edre, now I'll ask you to put on the sociologist's hat here. Because this is a, a generational goal, the things you're talking about are going to take a long time. It's going to take educating your colleagues, bringing up that new crop of undergraduates and graduate students. This is a long-term proposition, right? So on that basis, what are the things that seem immutable just about human nature, right? That even if highly educated academics run into these problems, it's like, well, if we're experiencing this in higher education, why should we have any hope? So what are those things about human nature where you know, you're just hitting a wall and it seems like we're just not going to make change. And where are those spaces where you are having these conversations, you, you do see forward progress? 
I'll say that there's at least two walls that math is hitting right now. Um, one, we are very much in tribes. You know, we we typically, I think this is just human nature, we like to work with people that we feel comfortable with. And this could just come down to people that look like us, people that have similar backgrounds as us, have the same language as what we speak. That's just a human nature thing. You know, it, it can even come down to as simple as, as a black male, I enjoy doing math with other black men. You know, for right or for wrong, that's just part of the human nature, the way things are, are done. That definitely leads to a slippery slope when it comes to doing math, because then you might have these tribes of people doing math. And again, it's this idea of not having a diverse set of views when it comes to working on math problems. So that's one thing that I think that we as people are going to have to learn how to, to get around, you know, just questioning who's in the room, but more importantly, who's not in the room. The second thing is math seems to like this idea of a genealogy. So I have an interest in working on certain problems. I may have an undergraduate advisor that then says, well, let's work together on some of these. This undergrad advisor would then recommend, you should go to grad school at this place where I got my PhD. So now my undergraduate advisor has me perhaps working either in the same area or with the same person that was his graduate advisor. And now I'm kind of part of this very much locked in lineage. Um, math people seem to like to do this quite a bit. And I'm not really sure if this is really a, a good thing to do. You know, people like to say, who is your academic grandfather? You know, so it's not just who you work with, but perhaps who is your advisor's advisor? Mm -hmm. You know, something like this. Um, and again, I think that this is something that's very much part of human nature, you know, us wanting to know who is, our, who is part of our lineage. But again, I think that that's going to be kind of a slippery slope. It just comes down to if you're so focused on saying that you're part of this lineage, that you know that you're part of this academic parentage, you know, who was your academic grandfather, academic grandmother, that again is going to lead into a stifling of creativity but it's something that, that happens in math all the time. Now with those two negative things, I think that there is a positive thing that is having change to happen. This idea of research experiences for undergraduates or REUs. Uh, the National Science Foundation started these, I don't know, maybe around 20 years ago or so. And now they really have exploded in the mathematics community. The idea of these is that it's a summer program that might last anywhere from six weeks to 10 weeks. Typically it's about eight weeks or so, where you would bring in students to a certain school and the students there would just do research with other students and with the faculty member. It's typically all paid for by the National Science Foundation. In working in these summer programs, the NSF encourages students from all different kinds of backgrounds. So these might be students that are at your fancy research institutions like your Caltechs or Harvard's or Princeton's. They might also come from your smaller liberal arts colleges like Pomona, like Grinnell College. They might even come from um, historically black colleges and universities or minority serving institutions or even women's colleges. So you have now all of these students from all these different backgrounds that all are on one campus at the same time, throwing out different ideas and trying to work on these different problems, but they're all working together. Now, if you imagine having an undergraduate that's done this for four years, seeing all these students from all these different backgrounds, that then gets away from the idea of having, let's say, um, tribes, students that are only working with other students that look like them, or even having these very stifled lineages. You know, now they don't have to worry about saying that my academic grandparents were kind of coming from this, this certain line. Everyone's coming from very, very different backgrounds. I am quite optimistic that because this has been around for so long, that the mathematics culture has changed quite a bit. Even you can see this in the last 10 years. And I think if you give it another 10 years, Math is going to be a very, very different place. Well, that's so exciting to hear. We'll have to stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. Edre, a question we're all dealing with right now. As a mathematician, during the year and a half in the pandemic and the mandates of physical isolation and remote work and all of that, 
what aspects of that may have been productive for your research, really not going so much any place, and what areas where, as you say, because it is such a collaborative endeavor, were detrimental to the work you were doing? So a couple of places that I think for me, it's been really great. Um, one, you actually see mathematics everywhere now. And I mean, that, that may not sound like it's, it's true, but you know, for example, when people first started to talk about COVID-19, there was a question of how do you know how fast the disease is spreading? And you actually had mathematicians on TV that were showing graphs and talking about exponential growth and talking about the statistics of how do you measure, you know, when people actually do have the disease, this concept of what's called R naught, you know, the reproductive rate. And I was loving it for the first six months. You know, I mean, it, it, it was bad that you had to kind of stay at home. You didn't really know what was going to happen with the disease, but really, Every night on the news, you actually saw mathematics being discussed. It wasn't being discussed in the sense of like, you know, just showing raw numbers and raw data, but really this concept of trying to understand the disease, that was purely a mathematical concept. People are trying to understand the mathematical model of how do you determine, how do you predict the future of this disease? So I thought that it was great that here we actually have the opportunity to have a national discourse on how do you use mathematics to figure out where we're going to be as a country 12 months from now. The second thing that worked out well for me, in a very practical sense, math still happens. People are still doing their research. They're still going to give talks and presentations, but they realized that they weren't able to travel to conferences or schools to give their talks. What mathematicians have done in the last 18 months or so is they've moved seminars online. So now there actually are hundreds of talks, not just in the country, but all over the world where everything is happening over Zoom. And a lot of us math people have different websites, email lists, where we're just saying, if you want to attend this seminar, here's the Zoom link. So I can easily attend seminars like in Germany and Italy and in and, and the United Kingdom, just all from the comfort of my computer. In fact, at one point, I actually gave a talk in um, Ireland I was actually in Scotland. I didn't even have to leave the country. You know, I just gave it from the comfort of, of my computer. But, but the point is that it was a major conference happening in Scotland, virtually at least, and I could give the talk there, but not worry at all about traveling. Now, I think a lot of us in math are questioning the future of that. I think the idea before the pandemic was we have to travel to places if we want to talk to other people, have collaborators or what have you. We really are rethinking that saying that we can do a lot of this online. And the pandemic is really what caused us to do that. So I think that that's a big positive thing that's happened. Probably the negative thing is math is not the easiest thing to really discuss, to present in an online format. You know, a lot of us still find it easy to be at the chalkboard, to actually write things down, to stand next to each other face to face and try to discuss things. An online platform hasn't really been great for that. There's some software out there that attempts to mimic this, but it's really not the same as having two people standing together in the same room at a chalkboard. So I think that we still need as a community, as a mathematical community, to figure out how do we get all of this to work? You know, it would be great if we could find a virtual way that several people could be at the chalkboard working at the same time. But until then, that's going to be the one thing about the math community that we all love doing, just, you know, the act of being at the chalkboard together. Andrew, just as a snapshot in time, circa November 2021, what are you working on right now? What's important to you? I'd say mathematically, um, this idea of what are called belly maps and descend on fonts, um, without really trying to explain like the, the gory details of all of this, I basically am trying to draw graphs on the surfaces of things. So think of like, say, a soccer ball. If you have a soccer ball, it's actually a series of um, hexagons and squares that are all kind of sewn in together. They're kind of interwoven in a nice, intricate way. But that's a nice object is really a drawing that I have on the surface of a sphere. That's one way to think of this. So I would like to do something like that, but for more exotic surfaces. Um, we call these Riemann surfaces in, in, in the parlance. But I really have been doing a lot of thinking of 
what are some of these objects? How can I draw them? And then there, of course, are other mathematical concepts that are associated to those. Um, what's called the fundamental groups. Also, you have the automorphism groups. There are these certain functions that allow me to generate these things that they're called belly maps. And I really am trying to figure out how to relate all of these together once I have these types of drawings, these so-called descend on fonts. So I even have a student that I met with earlier today that were actually in the process of writing a computer program where once we're given one of these so-called belly maps, it's essentially a function that kind of encodes the way these things should be drawn, that he has a program that should draw these in real time. About a year ago, the quickest I could draw them on a computer might take several hours, almost a day. Now he's found a way to draw these using just a mere few seconds. So I'm hoping that we can now have some really interesting, intricate drawings, but all using a computer to put all of these together. So that's the big thing that, that I'm thinking about mathematically. I'll say non-mathematically, I have been thinking, are there ways in which I can get more black and brown students interested in this area, this idea of number theory, algebraic geometry more generally? Um, a lot of students, like the way I was when I was a student, see mathematics as kind of a useless endeavor. You know, I, I'll just have to be honest about that. I think if you ask a typical undergraduate, what does a mathematician do? They will answer, they teach college, they teach high school. That actually worries me because that in general is not true. You know, mathematicians, just like what we saw with the pandemic, they can be out there in hospitals modeling diseases and how they're going to spread. They don't have to be in the classroom just teaching mathematics. So I've been trying to think of ways that I can really tell some students, tell my students at least, what are different things that mathematicians do when they're not teaching in the classroom. But then to kind of narrow down even more for the area that I work in, not a lot of students, even the brightest students that take the most advanced classes get exposed to number theory and algebraic geometry. So I'm trying to think of ways to get students exposed to those areas to hopefully eventually diversify the field, you know, try to convince the students to go off to, be, to get PhDs in these areas and then go out there in the world and, you know, try their best to kind of work on these types of problems. But it is a complicated question and it does have a, a difficult solution. So I've really been thinking, how do you get students interested in these areas so they continue in it? Andrea, this is such a great opportunity, like you said, not to go into the gory details, but to get mathematicians really to convey, as you said, that important question, what is it that mathematicians do? So my first question there is, and correct me if this is not the most fundal binary in mathematicians, but are you more in pure mathematics or applied mathematics? I'll say yes. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's, it's weird that I think a lot of people think that mathematicians have this binary way of thinking of it. You know, either you're pure or you're, you're implied. I like to think of it as um, math combines lots of different techniques. Really good math combines all of the techniques. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I was lucky enough that I double majored in math and physics, but I was only a handful of classes away from getting a third degree in applied mathematics. I actually loved applied mathematics. It's just that for whatever reason, I just decided to just kind of stop with, with math and physics. But even now, the work that I do combines all different ideas. Um, just to give you an example, sometimes when you're doing pure math, and I prefer nowadays to use more of the term theoretical math, that typically means that you're trying to prove something. So a question might be this. Um, there's the concept of a prime number. You know, this is a number that's only divisible by one in itself. So you have like, say, two, three, and five. The number six would not be prime because, you know, that's divisible by two and three, and that's different from one and six. What if I wanted to prove there are infinitely many prime numbers? That's a pure math question. A pure mathematician, if you will, a theoretical mathematician, will spend her time trying to prove that statement. And in fact, in a number theory class, this is something that you would prove, that there are infinitely many prime numbers. Once you have that, a question I typically like to give students is the follow-up question. We know that there are infinitely many prime numbers. Find me a prime number larger than a million. Now, we know that there's infinitely many. We know that one exists. So write down one. Now, you might say, okay, fine. What about a million and one? 
do you know that that's prime or not? Now, that question is an applied math question. How do you actually find this number? And can you write a computer program that can check that this is prime or it's composite? So to me, see, these questions are all hand in hand. It doesn't really make sense to just sit down and just try to write a proof that says that there are infinitely many primes, because at some point you actually need to find one. But in the same way, it doesn't make sense to kind of write a computer program that just finds as many prime numbers as you want, because you'll need to know, will you run out at some point or are there infinitely many? So with my research, I always combine those two concepts, this idea of theoretical math and this idea of applied math. Yes, I do want to prove things, but at some point I need to actually write down examples. So I do spend a lot of time thinking about computer programs and algorithms that would help me find the examples that I'm looking for. Even when I work with students, I still tell them, we're gonna need to write a computer program at some point. You know, we're not just gonna sit with a pen and paper at the chalkboard and try to prove things. We actually do need to write a computer program that's gonna find some examples. So to me, it's one of the same. You have to combine the two. Edre, in the way you so elegantly answered yes to the binary applied or pure, of course, the question is embedded in the administrative distinctions that even a place like Caltech draws, where there are different divisions. There are there are divisions. There's a Department of Applied Math and Pure Math. So to what extent are those administrative distinctions problematic, given that this is the kind of progress that the field needs? I think in a place like Caltech, it's becoming more and more true that those divisions are arbitrary. Um, yes, there is a math department, there is an applied math division, but there is this new department that essentially is something like computational biology, which is a really crazy concept because, you know, it used to be maybe 100 years ago, you might have pure mathematics, you might have applied mathematics, which is more of the computational side. You might have a computer science option that really does worry about the computations. And then you have biology, and the four would never talk. Now you have all four in one department, and you even have faculty that are jumping back and forth between all four areas. I think that's going to be the future of science, you know, that you're going to have to combine all four. I can't imagine that, say, a pure math department, the way it is now, is going to survive. You know, even here at Pomona, we've actually changed our name from the Department of Mathematics to the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. You know, we just understand that in some sense you have to evolve or die. Like we do understand that statistics is mathematics that's being used in many, many different departments. We as a college are also thinking about data science and kind of what's going to happen with the future there, how that's going to be mathematics and statistics and computer science used in lots of different departments in the humanities and even in say biology and chemistry. So I think that this is what's going to happen more generally. The math departments that are very traditional and only want to focus on, you know, let's teach linear algebra and let's kind of prove these big results is not going to be the kind of department that I think a lot of students will want to be a part of. I think a lot of these departments, as they're moving forward in the future, are going to have to think very much in an interdisciplinary way. You're saying then that mathematics is very much part of this broader academic trend of convergence, where these traditional walls that we place between academic departments are going to become less and less relevant or less and less important. I think so. I think so. Now, now, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of mathematicians that are kicking and screaming that they don't want the change to happen. You know, they very much want to keep their department in a very traditional sense that they just worry about the pure mathematics. They just have their blackboards and they don't want any of that to change. Unfortunately, I think departments that are like that are seeing the students vote with their feet. The number of math majors is slowly decreasing. And the number of students who have an interest in going into statistics or computer science is slowly increasing. I would love to see a math department very much like the way Caltech is thinking of things now, that it's not saying it's math, but it's saying maybe computational or something or other in this very general idea. So for me, an ideal department might look like having mathematics, statistics, computer science, and data science all together in one. Because I can tell you that with the work that I do, 
yes, it is very much founded in trying to work through doing something in pure math. But I need and I want students that know how to program. I also care about having a lot of data. I have another student right now, we're trying to form a database and we're actually talking about how do you actually pass information back into this database so we can use the information there to generate some other data that we need. That's more of a data science type of thing. So to me, we need all of this together. It's not just going to be a pure math department by itself, but I really do think that the ideal department we're gonna have in the future will be combining all of these together at once. In the way, Adria, that you said before that what motivates you more than anything is beauty, is, is elegance in the, in the numbers, in the calculations, in the equations. Would it be fair to say if I really tried to pigeonhole you that you are a pure mathematician, but you recognize the importance of mathematical tools for applications? I really, I think I got this when I was a student at Caltech, really view myself as a confused scientist who's really just trying to understand a couple of things. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, one thing I loved about my experience at Caltech was students chose a major based on the problems they wanted to solve. I've never seen that anywhere else. I, I had friends, this one friend in particular, he wanted to invent an invisibility cloak. He was completely obsessed with the idea of an invisibility cloak. So he thought freshman year, what do I need to create an invisibility cloak? Edre, I wonder if you might uh, explain what an invisibility cloak is. So think like Harry Potter. You know, the, the, it's this idea that if you have something like, um, it could be a coat or it could be maybe a garment. If you wrap it around you, then no one can see you. Now, this has been invented. So it does exist now in the real world. We didn't know this 20 years ago. You know, we were all 18 year old trying to figure all this stuff out. But the way that it works now, I think it's very much the way that my friend thought of it then. To have an invisibility cloak is an engineering question. So he wanted to become an electrical engineer just to solve this problem. How do you create an invisibility cloak? I mean, nowadays, my understanding is the way that this thing is created is you have to worry about like the properties of light and how light possibly bends if you take it and go through a medium. Some of this is by like based on Snell's law, some of the stuff that you learn in physics. But this friend majored in physics and electrical engineering because he wanted to build an invisibility cloak. And this is one of the things I loved about my time at Caltech, that you could talk to any undergrads and each one of them had their own pet project something they wanted to do, and they chose the major based on the project that they wanted to work on. So for me, I got obsessed with what's called group theory. It's not the easiest thing to explain. It's essentially like a set of axioms that you have to kind of form a certain mathematical structure. But the structure tells you the symmetries that a certain object might have. So for example, if you're holding, let's say like um, a laptop, then you can think of a laptop as a rectangle and you might ask, what are the different ways I can maybe rotate around this rectangle to kind of bring it back into its original position? I can maybe take the rectangle, I can kind of rotate it around, let's say 90 degrees. Or I could take the whole rectangle and I can maybe flip it upside down. That's another rotation by 180 degrees. Well, it turns out that the collection of symmetries I have, there are eight of them. And this is something that we call the dihedral group. Right. There's a lot of these groups that we kind of introduce here in the theory, and they're all kind of coming about from a very pure math standpoint by just writing down this list of axioms, things that you want to be true. I was very much obsessed with what are these axioms? Why do you want them to be true? Can you generalize some ideas of group theory? You know, this is really what I was very interested in as an undergraduate. So I realized that group theory is study in math but it's also studied in physics, in particular things like quantum mechanics, and it's studied in chemistry because you care about properties of, let's say, lattices or even properties of um, crystals. So I took group theory in math classes. I also took the group theory in physics classes, and I took group theory in the chemistry department, in chemistry classes. So it didn't matter to me what department I was in I wanted to solve the problem of what are groups? What is this idea of group theory? And that's really just something that I've kind of taken with me for the, the entirety of my career, that I have a series of questions I want to answer. I don't care how I'm gonna get the answer. 
It could be writing up a proof in pure math. It could be writing a computer program. It could be generating a whole bunch of data and just staring at the data, even running some statistical models to figure out, are there some patterns there that I need to find? If it's going to help me get a little bit more insight towards solving that question, then I'm going to try it. So, so yes, there have been times when I will just sit at a chalkboard and try to prove a theorem. Or there's times when I just sat there for hours writing a computer program. Or there's been times when I've looked at things like almost 4 million data points where I'm just staring there at the data and I've had to hand it to a statistician and ask, can you say anything about the distribution of the data here so that you can maybe tell me something that I'm missing? All of this I've done in the past just so I can answer a real, real simple question. What is a belly map? Or what is a descend on fault? You know, these to me are really simple questions I wish I was smart enough to come up with the answer to, but I'm gonna use as many different techniques as I can to try to answer them. Andre, in the way that physics has a very well-developed, even a teleological notion of where it's all headed, you know, a grand unified theory, a theory of everything, however you want to call what all physicists are sort of working towards. Is there a unifying concept in mathematics that mathematicians are also working toward? I would say yes, but I think it depends on the discipline maybe that, that you're working in. Um, the same way, I think it's probably fair to say in physics that when you're looking at perhaps like say the grand unified theory, that that's more or less the question, let's say like in particle physics or supersymmetry, you know, you're really trying to say, you know what happens on the small scale. So you'd like to say, this is also applied on the large scale. You know, you understand quantum mechanics relatively well, you understand electricity and magnetism, but how well does this fit into cosmology? You know, what happens on the sides of black holes? But I think that if you work in astrophysics, perhaps even in astronomy, you don't really have those same questions of like a grand unified theory. I get the feeling there that you're trying to maybe stare at this massive amount of data that you have coming in. And you're just trying to understand more about what does that data tell you? I've never gotten the feeling that astronomers care so much about quantum mechanics, but I do get the feeling that those who work in quantum mechanics would like to know how many of these same laws do we see hold on a larger, more classical scale? Mathematics is very much the same way. There are lots of different sub-disciplines that I think have their own questions and perhaps have their own grand unification theories that they're trying to work out. The area that I work in, number theory, algebraic geometry, is very much influenced by what's called the Langlands program. Um, all of this was started in the 1970s by a Canadian mathematician named Robert Langlands, who really came up with kind of a way of saying that some ideas that have been floating around for about 200 years might possibly make sense if we could prove a certain set of statements would be true. Um, some of those nowadays we call things like Langlands, reciprocity, um, but he mostly introduced very specific ideas that should say that they all should be related. Now, the way that this manifests itself, I would say more for the popular culture, comes about for people who've heard of the proof of Fermat's last theorem. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea that there was a French mathematician back in the 1600s or so, Pierre de Fermat, who had this statement, and I'm not gonna worry about repeating what it is, but he had a proof of the statement that he couldn't fit in the margin of his book. So people thought, well, he had a proof, but he didn't write it down. So perhaps it was lost all of this time, you know, so-called Fermat's last theorem. Well, in the mid 1990s, about 1994, 1995, there was a professor at Princeton, Andrew Wells, who came up with the proof of this theorem. Some people say that the proof was maybe incomplete. He had to, um, to acquire the help of his former student, Richard Taylor, to eventually come up with all the details of the proof. But nowadays, the proof is accepted as being correct and for my slash theorem is accepted as being true, some of us like to call it the Wiles, Taylor Wiles Fermat theorem, because essentially Wiles proved that this result is true, regardless of whether Fermat himself did have a proof but he just couldn't fit it in the margin of his book. Ironically, Wiles was not trying to prove for my slash theorem when he came up with the proof. He was trying to work through a specific instance of the Langlands program. Most people in popular culture don't know this, but those of us who work in the field actually understand Wiles is famous amongst mathematicians 
because he proved a specific case of Langland's reciprocity was true. That's really the big statement here for mathematics. So a lot of us do believe that if the Langlands program is true, kind of the series of ideas that Robert Langlands put forth, that he said that if you could prove the following statements are all true, then there's a lot you can do in mathematics. We really have been pushing towards that ever since the 1970s, ever since he first put that out there. So I think that it is fair to say in our area, in number theory, algebra, geometry, representation theory, there is a grand unification theory. It is this idea of the Langlands program. But I do want to be careful to say that it is somewhat narrow, you know, and that it does only work for this area of number theory, algebra, geometry, representation theory. Those who work in slightly different areas, perhaps in applied mathematics, perhaps in statistics, they don't really have the same type of a grand unification theory type thing. It's not even clear to me whether they have a certain program of things that they believe should be true, or even say a certain direction that perhaps they should try to prove to kind of push the area along. But I can say in the field that I work in is very clear. This is kind of the big, big thing that all of us have been pushing towards for the last 50 years or so. I'm very curious to get your perspective on a debate that I know you're familiar with, and that is where some physicists criticize string theory for being so far away from observational reality that it's quote unquote just math, right? What is right. your what is your take on the, the nature of the debate and the ability or non-ability of physics to be involved in the real world as we can see and measure it? I think a lot of this comes down to a very deep philosophical question of what is physics. I was taught as an undergraduate that physics is a description of what you can see. Now, see doesn't, of course, mean you can see it with your own eyes. You can generalize it to say that it's something that's observable. You know, you can conduct an experiment. You can figure out an oscilloscope that maybe can measure it in some kind of way. But there should be something you can observe by some device, by some machine. The question nowadays is, if you can't observe it, is it still true? It's not clear to me whether physics is going to resolve this anytime soon because, you know, th this is a fundamentally different way that physics has ever been viewed in the history of physics. Um, I think what happened was maybe back in the 1800s or so, you had people such as um, Michael Faraday, James Clerk Maxwell, they did incredible work in having these beautiful experiments but then also writing down these theoretical equations that could predict what the experiments were showing them. And even nowadays, electricity and magnetism, if you work out Faraday's laws and what James Kurt Maxwell had worked out as well, they are incredibly precise. You know, they're precise, they're beautiful. Physicists, I should say physics students, study Maxwell's equations even to this day, and they are just a wonderful, very well thought out, way of doing physics. About 100 years after that, let's say the early 19th century, let's say really the early 20th century, a lot of that changed based on experiments that people really couldn't explain. You know, you had, let's say, the uh, black body radiation experiments by Max Planck. You also had a lot of these thought experiments that Einstein himself was doing. And you couldn't really explain these things so people started to come up with really fancy mathematics. I'm still convinced that some of these young kids like Erwin Schrodinger and Heisenberg, they were just playing around with mathematics. I don't even think that they were 30 years old. They just happened just to play with the math and it worked. They were able to explain the experiments. They just couldn't really explain why the math was true. That I think is where physics really had a crisis the early 20th century or so. There were a lot of brilliant physicists who were playing with mathematics, people like Einstein, Paul Dirac, and others, who just had beautiful math that seemed to explain the experiments, but then the math almost took on a life of itself. You know, I, I like to tell my students that say, in pure math now, we have these classes in linear algebra. And linear algebra, of course, deals with things like matrices and matrix multiplication and trying 
how to do row reduction methods and what have you, a lot of the ideas of matrices actually grew out of what physicists were trying to do with quantum mechanics back in the early 20th century. They needed a way to kind of explain all of these observables. So essentially they just invented matrix multiplication. It was still infinite dimensional matrices, but they invented this to work. It was the mathematicians that kind of took on all of that, tried to codify and make it a little bit more rigorous, but still linear algebra kind of grew out of what the physicists were trying to do to more or less explain the experiments. This I think is really one of the issues that physics has to kind of resolve. You know, that there is a lot of beautiful mathematics that has just come out of attempting to explain the experiments. But now I think the mathematics has taken on a life of its own. I am a person that still does believe physics should not be divorced from the experiments. In fact, this is really the reason why I decided not to become a physicist myself, that I didn't want to spend all of my days just doing mathematics. I wanted to do math, but still be able to be in the laboratory, running the experiments and actually seeing a lot of these real time. It'll be interesting to me to see what will happen with physics over the next 100 years, whether physics, the math at least, will get to the point that it really matches up well with the experiments. But unfortunately right now, the math has really gotten to the point where the experiments can't keep up. You know, that the level of accuracy that you need for these experiments is nowhere near what you need to match it with the math. And that that is a little bit troubling. I don't know if it's troubling for everyone, but but for me, it is. Edre, the often used pyramid metaphor where mathematics is at the bottom, it's the most fundamental, and then there's physics and then chemistry and biology. What what do you like about that metaphor? What's problematic about that metaphor? What's problematic about it is that it's hierarchical. And, and I always worry whenever any system is hierarchical, um, you know, because then the question is, if you have something that forms the base of a pyramid, are you thinking of it as this thing is below another one, or maybe that this one is more important than another subject? Also, it doesn't really take into account how interdisciplinary a lot of this is, but interdisciplinary more in the sense of like it's, they influence each other. So for example, as I just mentioned, you could take linear algebra, this idea from pure mathematics. Yes, it is true that physics uses linear algebra, but linear algebra came about because of physics. Mm -hmm. So it's not clear to me whether it's fair to say that physics uses linear algebra, the physics uses this branch of math, or if it's fair to say the math grew out of what the physicists were considering. I think a lot of this is also happening in other areas. So in math, we have this idea of what's called a differential equation. You know, it's basically an equation that kind of explains solutions that you might have if you write down an equation from calculus. Well, in biology nowadays, you really are trying to understand perhaps how things grow, how infectious diseases spread. That can be described using differential equations, which is a branch of mathematics. So I would argue that this area of math is inspired by biology, as opposed to saying biology is using this part of mathematics. So I really do like to think of all of these areas as influencing each other. So it's not just that biology is built on math, but I would also argue that math is built on biology, that there is a symbiosis of how these are all working together. That I don't see in this pyramid idea, and that's what, what I worry, that there really isn't a recognition that we are all influencing each other. You know, there are people that work in mathematical biology or people who work in, say, mathematical physics, that they understand that one area can influence the other. It's not just the mathematics that other areas are using, but sometimes the mathematics is being influenced by these other STEM fields. Edre, really broad question, and it's going to be one that we'll ask you to reflect all the way back to perhaps graduate school, and that is, what has been the role of computers in your research? What have computers allowed you to do? And to flip that question around, in what ways have computers constrained the research because of the way people perhaps rely on them and not their own 
artistic imagination or however you want to understand that? So I was very, very fortunate that I got introduced to Mathematica at Caltech probably within the first month I was on campus as a freshman. This is Stephen Wolfram's program you're referring right, to. Stephen Wolfram's program. Um, it may have been like Mathematica version three. Like, I mean, it was something like that. Now I think it's up to version 13 or something like this. So I just assumed Mathematica existed everywhere. If you wanted to do any crazy computations, there it is. I didn't quite realize that you know, Wolfram was there at Caltech essentially when he invented it. And that if you're a physics major at Caltech, you're gonna know Mathematica. I had no idea until after after I left Caltech. But I've used Mathematica for everything since, since I was a freshman. It's been 30 years and you know I still love using it. And I think that it, it is a wonderful, wonderful tool. I want to be careful though to say that it's a tool for exploration. Mm -hmm. That's that's really the, the way that I see it. When I was in grad school, my advisor more or less gave me a question to say, there was a guy who wrote a thesis at Harvard University back in the 1970s. There was a conjecture he was trying to prove. He wasn't able to prove the conjecture in general, but he was able to find one example of this conjecture being true by doing a lot of hard work to write down what's called a modular form that's associated to a certain Galois representation. Now, he was using computers back in the 1970s, which was even more impressive when you realize that he had to write everything to get all this to work. You know, he just couldn't use the Mathematica, he really had to write everything from scratch. After he wrote his thesis in the 1980s, people came up with maybe like another five, six examples, but there were only a handful of examples of this conjecture being true. My advisor said, asked me, can you maybe prove this conjecture in a different way by perhaps finding this person's example from the 1970s, but using a totally different numerical technique? His thought was twofold. One, if I can come up with a different technique, then maybe I can come up with more examples, perhaps even prove that there are infinitely many and not just worry about like the six that were known up to them. And number two, maybe I can come up with a larger proof of the conjecture that wouldn't just rely on writing down more and more examples. So of course, for me to do this, I first had to write a computer program that could come up with one example. So I spent a lot of time for my thesis just writing a computer program that will come up with this one example. It wasn't reproducing the example from this diary from the 1970s. It was coming up with a completely different method. But I was able to do it. I do want to point out, though, that for my thesis, I spent a lot of time with Mathematica writing a computer program. I probably spent two years doing nothing more than just sitting in front of Mathematica writing this program. Now, of course, after I got the program written and I had the example, then I was able to actually write a really nice proof that kind of generalized some ideas. But the point is, here I was in a pure math department, spending two years of my life as a grad student writing a computer program. So I definitely saw it as an exploratory tool that I can get a better idea of what the general theorem should be. That's the way I've always viewed computers, that it should be a good first step and writing down examples to get some intuition of what should happen more generally. I'll also say that I think of it in the opposite direction as well. Let's say that you do have a theorem, something that you prove. To me, if you know the theorem well enough, you should be able to write down a computer program based on the theorem, based on the proof of the theorem, they should give you examples. Like what I mentioned earlier, this idea of say, proving that there's infinitely many prime numbers versus finding an explicit example of a prime number greater than a million. Well, if you really know the proof that there are infinitely many prime numbers, if you really know that proof well, that gives you a way to write an algorithm so you can actually find a prime number greater than a million. So there, the theory actually informs the computation, but you still have to write a computer program that tries to do it. So I've always thought of those as one of the same, you know, that they're always kind of hand in hand. It's not just fair to say that if you write a computer program, you're never going to do any theory. And it's not fair to say that if you only care about theory, that you're never going to write a computer program. Um, I've always thought that one always influences the other. Now, you asked about limitations, and, and I certainly will say that the big limitation of computers is you only have a finite amount of time to do the computation, and you only have a finite amount of memory to run the computation. This could be memory in terms of RAM, 
um, how much you can actually hold in the physical st storage space while the computer's thinking about it, or even let's say what's happening with the hard drive, you know, physically how much you actually save to a disk. But it's those physical limitations that mean that you're never really gonna be able to compute everything. You're always gonna have to have, you will always have something that you won't quite be able to compute. Now, that being said, it might come down to just waiting until you have a faster computer or a more powerful computer that has more space, or even if somebody comes up with a fancier algorithm that runs just fast enough that the computer can compute what you want in the amount of time that you have allocated. But you are always gonna be at the mercy of how fast is the computer you have or how much memory it, it has. Given the, fact, given the fact that we are what seems to be in the midst of a revolution leading to quantum computers, is there anything specifically that you're excited about that classical computing can't do that quantum computers might? So my understanding about quantum computers is it really comes down to coming up with algorithms that a quantum computer can do that an analog computer cannot. So, for example... When people were first coming up with things like the analog computers or even like the first digital computers, you really had to worry about very specific steps of how do you add numbers together? How do you multiply numbers together eventually? So for adding, we do it very much like the way that, say, you're taught in elementary school, that you have kind of the ones place. So, you know, you might add like three plus seven, you put a zero, you carry that to the tens place. But the point is that you're kind of doing it digit by digit. That's just the way that we just naturally think of adding numbers. You kind of add things digit by digit, and eventually you find what you care about. My understanding is that Charles Babbage and you know Ada Lovelace, when they first came up with these first computers, this is the way that they thought of it. That the idea of addition was, is something you could just do digit by digit, and eventually you'll get things to work out. But now, of course, you have to worry about the allocation of how many digits are you allowed to store? Are you going to have like say an 8-bit computer or a 256-bit computer? You know, how many more bits do you need to actually be able to do larger and larger computations? But still, the idea is that you're just kind of doing it digit by digit to get it to work out. If you have a quantum computer, you can try to say, what if we had an algorithm that doesn't add digit by digit? What if we came up with an algorithm now that maybe uses this idea of not just like, you know, a binary digit, perhaps it's going to use like a quantum bit, a qubit, bit, to actually do the computations. That to me is the exciting part. It's more the freedom of saying you're no longer constrained to what you're used to with analog and digital computers. You don't have to worry about just adding things digit by digit and being constrained to the number of bits that your computer might have. Now you can just be creative and come up with crazy algorithms that it's not so much run faster, but they're gonna run differently. That's what I would love to see for the future of quantum computing, just coming up with completely new ideas of how to do some of these computations. And you know, I'm sure that there's algorithms out there that people have that haven't even been invented yet. But that to me is the exciting part for mathematicians is coming up with something that hasn't been thought of because now we're dealing with a computer that's no longer analog or digital. It's a completely different beast that we've never thought of before. Andrea, a question about the social side, the community of mathematicians that are important to you. So the project Mathematicians of the African Diaspora, can you mm -hmm. explain the origins of that project and your involvement in it? Yeah. I'm actually a custodian of this project and I took it over from someone else who started it almost 30 years ago. I really say closer to 25 years ago. Uh, Scott Williams was a professor at SUNY Buffalo who started the whole project in the late 1990s or so. I believe that the project went live in 1997. Um, he's a black mathematician. He worked in topology for the longest time. He would just go to conferences in his field if he happened to run into another black mathematician, he would just make it a point to mark down that person's name, maybe talk to the person, learn a little bit about their story. And he would eventually just create a web page where he would just talk, talk about that person. He did this for about 10 years or so, going to conferences, other events, meeting people, writing down the information, writing a bibliography, creating a page. And he eventually created, I believe, maybe about 600 profiles of mathematicians and maybe another 300, 400 pages of just stories from things that he heard about, heard from people. It was completely a labor of love. He got no money for it. He just did it because he, 
he was genuinely interested in learning about other black mathematicians, computer scientists, and physicists. Well, he retired in 2008, and I remember him telling us, maybe about 2005 or so, that he was going to retire soon. He really needed somebody to take over these pages. He just didn't want the set of a thousand pages to go away. This was at the Conference for African American Researchers in the Mathematical Sciences, also known as CARMS. Um, a lot of us Black mathematicians had known of each other. I had known of Scott Williams since I was a grad student, and I attended this conference over and over again. And I just remember Scott telling stories about people that he would meet, people that he wrote about in the pages, also saying that somebody really needed to take over these pages because he was going to retire. He did retire in 2008, and no one really stepped up to take on the pages. They just kind of languished for years and years. A good friend of mine named Don King, who's a professor at Northeastern University, which is telling me on and off over the years that he was kind of thinking about maybe taking over the pages and maybe trying his best to update them, to make sure that we had new profiles that were being added. But he always said he didn't really know much about websites and he didn't really know where to go to even get the funding to do all of this. Fast forward now to uh, 2015, when I became president of the National Association of Mathematicians. So this is the nationwide organization of black mathematicians. There was an event that we had maybe within the first year or so that I was president. And I happened to be standing around chatting with Don King and another friend, Osamoa Inquanta, who is department chair at an historically black college in Baltimore, Morgan State University. Um, Asamoah had written lots of papers about black mathematicians, so he was very well versed in just the history of what's happened with black mathematicians. You know, he knew a lot of specific stories about people, and he himself was also very concerned with the future of the pages. So the three of us pretty much decided we were going to work together and try our best to update the pages. Now, neither of us had any experience in website design or even raising money to do website design. But we just decided we were going to try it. We were going to do the best that we could. I mentioned CARMS, this conference for African American researchers. The person who had created the website for that was named John Weaver. And John's someone that we would see at the CARMS conference over and over again. You know, he just he wasn't a mathematician, but he had a lot of friends that would go to the CARMS conference. So I got to know John pretty well over the years. That meant that the four of us decided we were going to get together and try our best to update the website. It took us about four to five years to figure out how to do this. And it, it's a very complicated procedure. Uh, we first had to figure out how to create a database. Scott Williams didn't have a database. He just had a series of 1,000 pages. So there was no way to search. There was no way that any of these were linked. So we had to take all of the content, put it into a database, figure out how to make the database searchable. Then we realized that not all the information was correct because, of course, Scott was just getting all of this from word of mouth or things that he can kind of piece together. So we had to hire students to go in and verify the information, go online, try to find photos, email addresses, website addresses, rewrite some of the biographies in some cases, you know, now put all of this from scratch. We also need to worry about raising money so that we could essentially pay for all of this. So I would say that over the years, I've had to raise on the order of $100,000. And I had no experience in, in fundraising for these kinds of things. But you know, I had to learn pretty quickly how to raise enough money so we could put all of this together. So after working hard on moving everything over to a database, hiring students that were going to update things, making sure that we were adding in new names of people that Scott hadn't added since about 2008 or so, I feel pretty comfortable with where we are now. Um, I do have a series of students, even today, that I'm working with that are looking to update the pages. I have eight undergrads from Pomona College, and I'm working with a colleague who has another five undergrads at Cal Poly Pomona. And we're spending the rest of this academic year doing the same thing as before, updating the data based writing biographies, looking for photographs and even new names of people that are currently not in the database. It's sitting at about 800 names. My ultimate goal is to take every Black American who's ever graduated with a PhD in the mathematical sciences and add them to the database. 
I'm estimating there are no more than 5,000 such black mathematicians. Wow. The first guy got his degree, I believe, in 1923 or so, Albert Frank Cox. So I think that we can do this. It may take us another five or 10 years, but, but I think it is possible to take everyone who's ever graduated with a PhD and add them here to this database. Ed Dre, in your work in this project, what has been most satisfying in immersing yourself in this understanding that black achievement in mathematics has this deep and rich history to it? What's satisfying for me is seeing the connections. You know, I, I don't think that I really thought of all of the connections, how all these individuals all kind of know each other and all kind of work together with each other. So I'll give you an example. Um, <clears throat> The second black American to get his PhD in mathematics is Dudley Woodard. When he graduated from the University of Pennsylvania, he eventually went to Howard University where he was the dean and he started a master's degree program to kind of help other black Americans to go get their advanced degrees in mathematics. When he started this program, there was a young undergraduate from Howard named William Plater that he recruited to be in the very first class of the master's program. Well, Clater eventually got his master's degree and Dutter, Woodard convinced Clater to go off and get a PhD at the same school he got his PhD in math and they're the same advisor where he got his PhD. So this meant that just a few years later, William Clater became the third black American to get his PhD in mathematics. Going down the line now, William Clater eventually will go to a school in West Virginia and he was teaching mathematics there at one of the local colleges and one of the students that he had, you now know as Katherine Johnson, the Perlman who was in Hidden Figures. So this meant that Katherine Johnson was actually being taught calculus by the third Black American to get his PhD in mathematics. This is beautiful scene in the movie Hidden Figures where Katherine Johnson is trying to work out some orbitals and she says things like that she needs to know analytic geometry in order for her to do all this. Analytic geometry nowadays is called calculus. And a lot of us believe that the calculus she actually learned was from William Clater, the person who was the college professor that taught her back when he was in West Virginia. So like this is just this beautiful connection of the second black American to get his PhD in math with the third black American to get his PhD with Katherine Johnson that leaves everything up to present day that I don't think that I really understood and said so I'll start to put all of this history together. And this is just one of the things that I love about history more generally is that there are all of these connections that you see. It just comes down to that you just really have to understand the history, dig a little bit more deeply into it, and you'll just see all of these beautiful connections all laid out in front of you. Perhaps there's one mathematician you have in mind specifically, or maybe more as an overview of all that you've learned. But given that so much of this achievement in black, black mathematics happened when obviously Af African Americans did not have good opportunities in education, did not have good opportunities in being supported by professors. Is there something that sticks out in your memory that just is so over the top impressive for what a black mathematician has achieved in earlier generations? I would say yes. Um, one story that comes to mind is named Vivian Malone Mays. Um, She's someone that I do not know personally, and she is, I believe, the fifth Black woman to get a PhD in mathematics. But what's fascinating about her story is that it's one of perseverance. I think a lot of the Black mathematicians that you read about certainly suffered a lot over the years. You know, it, it's easy for us to forget that there were many schools in the country that forbade Black Americans from attending the schools. You know, for example, the University of Texas system really didn't let Blacks attend any of the schools until about the 1960s or so. Um, a lot of colleges were this way. This is one of the reasons why historically Black colleges were a minute in the first place. Blacks were just not allowed to attend a lot of these schools. It was part of the state's charter. It was part of the statement there at the school. Um, Favine Malone Mays was born in Texas, right around Baylor, Texas. She decided to go as an undergraduate to Fisk University in Tennessee. There, one of her teachers was the third black woman to get a PhD in mathematics. Evelyn Boyd Granville was still alive today. She's over 100 years old, but she's still alive. And the department chair at the time was a guy named Lee Lorch. 
Now, Lee Lorch was a Jewish mathematician, but he was very, very much an activist. You know, if you study the civil rights movements from the 60s, then you know that there were these um, freedom rights, people who were kind of traveling from the north down south to kind of help out with like voter registration and what have you. A lot of the freedom riders wouldn't go directly to, let's say, places like Alabama and Georgia. They would kind of stop in Tennessee so they can kind of um, get their acts together, figure out exactly what they were going to do. Because, I mean, people were literally dying with buses being set on fire, people being dragged off the buses, beaten to death. So they had different classes and nonviolence there in Tennessee to kind of get people ready for what they were going to see when they went down south. Lee Lorch was one of the individuals who was very, very much involved with that. If you actually go to the Civil Rights Museum in Tennessee, there's a specific exhibit for Lee Lorch. You know, when Lee Lorch passed away, there was a beautiful obituary written in the New York Times about all the activism that he had done over the years. Now, remember, Evelyn, or I should say, the being Malone Mays was about 16, 18 at the time, and these are her college professors. Third black woman to get a PhD in mathematics and the indefatigable Lee Lorch. So they eventually convince her to major in mathematics. They convince her to stay on at FIST to get her master's degree. And I don't know how they do it, but they eventually convince her that she should get a PhD in mathematics. So she decides that she's going to go back to Texas, where she's from. You know, she's maybe her mid to late 20s or so. She first applies to Baylor University. Baylor in general has a rule, no blacks are to be admitted to the school. So she gets a letter, you know, mid 1960s or so saying, because she's black, she cannot be admitted to Baylor University. So she decides instead, she's not deterred. She applies for the PhD program at the University of Texas at Austin. So she gets in, she's there in her classes. And fortunately, there was a very well-known racist bigot named R.L. Moore, Robert Lee Moore, who made it very clear. He did not want Vivian Malone Mays in his classes, and he didn't want any of his students to talk with her. So you see all of these stories written by Vivian Malone Mays and even by people that knew her that said things like when she was in grad school, she really wanted to work in this area of topology, but R.L. Moore would not physically allow her in the classroom. So she had to sit in the hallway to kind of listen to his lectures. Also, a lot of her friends in grad school will go to one of these coffee shops in the area just to sit around and talk about math, because you know, this is what grad students do. Apparently, she wasn't allowed to go into the coffee shops with the friends because Aura Moore told the students, don't let her in there. So you can imagine for anyone else, this would just destroy your thoughts of getting a PhD in mathematics. But she still made it through and she got her PhD. And in a really weird, beautiful twist of fate, the very first position she got as a faculty member was at Baylor University. You know, because just a couple of years after she had applied, she was rejected for getting in for being black. They actually have rescinded all of that. And now she came back as a professor. And so she actually was the very first black professor in all departments that was hired at Baylor University. Wow. Like, like that's one of these beautiful stories that you realize that it was her mentors who just encouraged her, no, you go on no matter what, because we fight for civil rights, so you have to do the same thing. And here you have Vima Mays. she did exactly the same thing. So it, it's story after story that you see like that when you actually are going through the history of, of all of this. So for me, it's really inspiring. This is why I really am inspired to kind of tell more people about these stories, to learn more about the stories so I can get more stories like this out there. But it's just remarkable, the kind of things that you see. Adrian, the way that you've marveled at all of these connections in the history of Black mathematics, do you see in ways that you didn't before your involvement in this project, your own intellectual heritage and connections for your approach to math and where that might fr come from culturally in the history of this field? I, I would say so. Um, I think that it's affected me maybe in, in, in many different ways. Um, you know, when I was an undergraduate, I was very interested in history. Um, I didn't quite major in history, but definitely my senior thesis was in history. I spent pretty much the majority of my senior year in the history department. Um, I even won the Rod Paul Prize, which is like for the top student graduating in history for the work that, that I did. So I've always wanted to get back to the roots 
of being in history. I just never imagined it would quite be in this way, but for me, it feels very natural to work on this project. Also, a lot of what I've seen historically helps me to keep things in perspective of what's happening today. You know, when I take a look at some of the mathematicians that I've seen over the years, just in reading some of these stories, I then see some who, like Vivian Malmais, were very inspired by their mentors, and they went on to have very successful careers. So that means I have to think for myself, am I doing the right thing by mentoring my students? Am I doing enough to encourage them to also go on? I see, because I see it from a historical lens, the power of being a really, really good mentor. But in the same way, I also see stories of individuals who are completely beaten down by the system, by racism, by being ignored, by being shunned. And in the same way, I have to ask myself, what about the students who don't feel comfortable staying in mathematics? Am I being active enough to make sure that I'm kind of eliminating some of those barriers, some of those negative experiences that students are experiencing that are driving them away from the field? So just by looking at the history, looking at these stories, it really is helping to inform how I think about what's happening in the field today. And I, I really have to be careful because I realize that I don't have all the answers. But at least in seeing the stories, I think it's helped me to ask the right questions. I'd like to ask about some key funding sources that are most important, both for your research career, but also in the way that you want to make mathematics more diverse and inclusive. So let's start first with the National Security Agency. Of all agencies, mm -hmm. I'm curious, why is the NSA interested in supporting what you're doing right now? So the NSA is certainly interested just in the outreach of doing mathematics. Um, I had a graduate fellowship where I actually worked for NSA for a couple of summers. Um, I view NSA as a place that just has a lot of employees who love mathematics. And I do realize that it can be viewed in a very controversial way, um, but really the people that I work with I think are very conscientious people. They certainly do understand the consequences of the math that they do, but also in general, they really, really love mathematics. There are different ways in which you can get funding from the National Security Agency. The way that I've gotten funding the last several years is from their REU program, you know, this research experience for undergraduates. Um, NSA doesn't really like to get funding for, let's say, security research, because kind of the feeling is, they do it, they do it well, they're not gonna pay other people to do security kind of research. So instead, they prefer to give money just for enrichment, more or less they count this as for outreach. So I do appreciate having funding from NSA so that I can expose students to the beauty of doing mathematics. That's the whole idea of getting funding for an RU, just so that I can expose it to them. And the National Science Foundation on many programs has been such a strong supporter of your efforts on so many levels to make mathematics more diverse and inclusive. Can you tell me about the origins of your partnership with the NSF and what they've allowed you to do? Definitely, they've allowed me to do quite a bit, but I'd say it from very different points of view. Um, of course, there is the RU, so the funding that I've got from the NSF for this research experience for undergraduates. It's the same concept as with the NSA, and that is very much for outreach. You know, there you're just trying to expose undergraduates to the beauty of the subject. So I felt very fortunate in getting funding from NSA in that sense. Also, I've gotten funding from the NS, sorry, NSF. I've also gotten funding from the NSF for running conferences. You know, one of the ideas is that you want a way for undergraduates to present the work that they've done in the past. When I was president of the National Association of Mathematicians, we received funding from the NSF to run what we call MathFest. This is an activity that takes place over about two and a half days that really is meant for undergraduates, specifically undergraduates from minoritized groups, but I'll say even more specifically, undergraduates from historically black colleges and universities to give talks, presentations on the research that they've done the summer before. So what's beautiful and remarkable about NAM's undergraduate math fest is that you might have on the order of 20 or so black and brown undergraduates all talking about mathematics research. This doesn't happen anywhere else on the planet. 
but these are definitely beautiful, high-level research projects. Some of it can be theoretical math, some of it might be statistics, it might be applied math, but it's all mathematics. They actually don't really have faculty giving talks at this conference. The idea is that it's really for undergraduates by undergraduates. Primarily you have on the order of like 100 or so undergrads that attend this conference, another 20 or so undergrads that present talks, maybe another 15 or so undergrads that present posters, but it's all about undergraduates presenting to other undergraduates. And I really love the fact that the National Science Foundation understood the importance of this and was willing to, to help fund it. What I'll say more generally is that it certainly feels good to be supported by this government agency in different points of view. So when I'm doing the REU, that is funding for research. There, it's very much about saying that we want to not only encourage undergraduates to learn about the beauty of mathematics, but we also want to expand the knowledge of mathematics itself. When you're dealing with the conferences, that's more for undergraduate education, let's say, if you will. So there, you really are giving undergraduates the opportunity to present on what they already know. And of course, as we know, whenever you kind of give a lecture on something that you think you know, you get to know it better. <laughs> so I love the fact that we have funding there from the NSF in a very different point of view, from the undergraduate education, so that undergrads can present to other undergraduates. So it's just been really great that, that I've gotten funding over the years, you know, in very, very different points of view, but all to kind of put forward this math. Andrea, your wonderful essay, Three Questions, The Journey of One Black Mathematician. What are those three questions? And why did you frame the essay in such an interesting way where you posed these questions and wanted to submit them outward for the community to think of themselves? So that piece was really meant to be an introspective think piece. Um, I have to admit, I'm a big fan of The Walking Dead. And, and really the questions come from something that one of the protagonists, Rick Grimes, would say. You know, The Walking Dead is this story of um, this dystopian future where zombies have taken over and kind of like humanity has completely fallen apart. And when you're kind of walking through the woods, you don't know who you're going to meet. You don't know if it's going to be someone who's, say, just like starving for food and that they really need help, or if it's going to be someone who might be out to kill you. So Rick Grimes had this rule. Whenever he would meet someone, he would ask three questions. And the questions at the time were, I believe, um, um, how many people have you killed? Um, why did you kill them? And I don't know, something like, would you kill again? I'm not going to remember the exact three questions. But, you know, it was something where he was really asking this person that he would meet, essentially, are you a good person or are you a bad person? Can I really discern who you are based on how you answer these questions? That's the general idea of this think piece. And let me see if I can really remember what the questions were. Um, in this article, I asked the question, this was more for myself, how many Black students have you met in your department? How many black faculty have you hired in your department and why? So the three questions for me at least were meant to say for the department that I was in, because I was there at Purdue University for 14 years, how many black undergraduates, how many black students would say, do you have in the department? I was really more focused on the number of black PhD students Although I could have asked more generally what's happening with, with Black students all over campus. I wanted to know how many Black PhD students had we had historically in the department. That meant that I had to go through some records. I really had to do some history to try to figure out of all of the students that Purdue has had in the entire history of the school giving out PhDs, how many were Black? I think at the time I came with the number seven, which really shocked me. But I don't really think I was, was expecting an answer one way or the other. So I think it just surprised me that the number was seven because Purdue graduates on the order of about 25 every year. That means if you run the numbers, maybe the department's been around for about 50 or 60 years giving out PhDs, that there might be close to like, I don't know, about a thousand or so PhDs out there in mathematics from Purdue University. So hearing that there were just seven total in the history of the department, that for me was shocking. So then I decided to ask about faculty, very similar question. How many black faculty have the department ever had in the history of the department? I knew in the 14 years I was there 
the math department had only hired one black faculty in those 14 years. That was me. So I wanted to know before me how many other people had come. And again, I don't remember the exact numbers. It might have been something like three. So again, the number of black faculty was very, very small. For comparison, there's around 100 faculty in the department now. So if there were only three total out of maybe 50, 70 years of the department, actually the department's been around for closer to 100 years now. That for me was also very surprising. So the third question was not so much a quantitative question asking how many, it's more qualitative. Why? Why is this the case that there are seven? But that really is a double-edged sword because I wanted to know why in a bad sense of why so few, but also why in the good sense of what had we done right and that we had attracted these students or these faculty. So again, it was really a think piece, but I put this out there more for faculty at other schools to ask the same question. If you look at your own PhD department or even look at your own undergraduate institution, how many black students do you have? If you look at the faculty that you have, how many black faculty do you have? And then instead of asking the quantitative question, asking more of the qualitative, why? Is there something that you're doing right that you're attracting all of these students? More like what I was asking here at Pomona College versus something that you're doing wrong that might be driving them away. So, you know, really just being very introspective about all of this. Andre, the last topic I'd like to engage with you for today's session is one that's very much still current events at Caltech, and that is the decision to rename some of the buildings that have been associated with professors and benefactors who, of course, were associated with the eugenics movement. So to put this in historical context, when you were a student at Caltech, of all of the problems that you might have dealt with, from microaggressions to more overt problems, was the fact that the tallest building on campus being named after Milliken, was that something specifically that was problematic for you or that was more a general issue and it wasn't specifically on your radar back then? So ironically, that wasn't the key issue, but there was another issue that was a key issue that I still want Caltech to, to address. Um, I can't say that I was aware of Robert Milliken and his work with eugenicists in particular. I've always worried about putting men's names on buildings literally as a monument to them without being very questioning of who they were as individuals. Um, one thing that I learned when I was an undergraduate kind of doing the research of minorities at Caltech is the curious meeting of William Shockley and Grant Venerable. Now, Grant Venerable was the first black student to graduate from Caltech, did so in, in 1932. But if you take a look at the yearbooks going way back when, Grant Venerable and William Shockley were in the same class. Now, William Shockley, a lot of us as physics majors know because he would go on to win the Nobel Prize because he invented the transistor. You know, the transistor is ubiquitous in all of electronics today. You can't run a computer, you can't run on a laptop, you can't even run a watch. In fact, can't even run your car these days without the transistor. Now, I don't remember if Shockley's name was literally on any of the buildings at Caltech, but certainly being a physics major, you're very much aware of this guy who has his undergraduate degree, who got the Nobel Prize, it's a big, big name in physics. When I was an undergraduate, I remember turning on television, watching PBS at one point, and there was an old, old interview of William Shockley Maybe he was like in the 1970s from this interview, but he was discussing a little bit just about his philosophy on life and science and what have you. So the interview at one point asked him about how he invented the transistor and what it was like to win the Nobel Prize and what have you. Then the interview eventually went to his thoughts on current society and where he thought things should go. Here was this 19, 20 year old black kid in Los Angeles, you know, finishing up my degree at Caltech watching this older white guy on television talk about how he thought he felt bad for Blacks because they were mentally inferior. And he was completely convinced from their lack of social mobility, from their lack of entering colleges and universities and getting degrees, that this was just empirical proof that Blacks were inferior. 
And he really wanted to do something to help out Blacks. I could see that he was trying to approach this from a very kind point of view, but also he was approaching this from a very openly racist point of view. That more disturbed me than I think anything that I've seen about Milliken, because that was a direct lineage for me. You know, seeing this guy who had a Caltech degree, the Caltech hyped up as one of his great alumni who had a Nobel Prize, who had worked on something that was so ubiquitous in everything that we see in the everyday life, but yet saying that he had such horrific views that were all right there for the world to see. And knowing that he was a classmate of the very first Black alum from Caltech was also very jarring for me to kind of see those two juxtaposed. I've always wanted to delve into that a little bit deeper because it's not clear to me that Shockley was even aware that even though he said he had all of this empirical proofs that Blacks were mentally inferior, that his classmate was a Black student. And I just want to delve into that a little bit deeper. I would argue that yes, Caltech is doing the right thing at the very least in questioning the names for the individuals that they have in their buildings. But I think it will be better for Caltech to really delve a little bit more deeply into some of the beliefs that some of these individuals had to really question why is it that we're gonna take the names off the of buildings. That I think is gonna to help to be a little bit more informative to individuals, because for right now, I think a lot of individuals have this knee jerk reaction of, well, we live in a cancel culture. We're just taking the names down just because people think that it's the wrong thing to do. I would very much like to focus a little bit more on exactly what did these individuals say and believe so that more in the Caltech community will really understand why some of this is problematic. Edre, were you involved in some of the debates in 2019 and 2020 that led to the creation of the renaming committee? And did you have the opportunity during these discussions to make this point that you're making to me now, that there needs to be a more expansive look at the way Caltech understands and celebrates some of its most prominent figures in history? I I was not. I think I just read about it like the other alumni did. You know, I remember when the article... Um, the LA Times came out from this one alum who really tried to put a lot of the information out there. I just remember tangentially hearing about the conversations at Caltech. I think I remember hearing when this commission was formed, but you know, I wasn't formally involved with, with any of that. Um, here at Pomona College, we actually were having our own set of discussions about all of this. Um, ironically, the building that I'm in now, where my office is, was named Milliken Labs, same Robert Milliken. Before I got here, though, back in 2018, there already was a lot of discussion amongst the faculty, the students, and the alumni about changing the name of the building. And by the time I got here, the Board of Trustees had already voted to take the name off. There was more discussion of what were they going to change the name to. So we actually did change the name of the building about a year ago, right about the time the discussion at Caltech was starting to happen about changing the names. Um, so now we actually call the building Estella Labs because we named it after, I believe, like the granddaughter of one of the donors of other buildings that we have here in the, the science complex. But I can tell you that there was a very similar discussion happening here at Pomona. That discussion, though, was a little bit more on can we think a little bit more carefully about who the buildings are named after, perhaps going back to see what is it that they believe, what is it that they did, um, I know that there's a more general question of what's the process by removing names on buildings, if that is something that we want to do. But I can tell you that at least that discussion of having Milliken removed from the physics and math building, that was something that happened before I got here. So really when I got here, it was already a done deal. So I found it really interesting that while Caltech was starting the discussion, Pomona had already finished it and moved on. Edre, in the way that you're approaching this from a deeper level, right? My last question for today, and it's one that is really of paramount importance in the way we go forward. So the one issue, as you say, is there's this debate between, you know, maybe some benefactors or senior faculty that this is just cancel culture. And there's graduate students who say, I want all of this, you know, take these, na these names down, 
yesterday, right? That's the debate that we're in the middle of right now. But the question moving forward and the one that's so important to get right from the beginning is how do we ensure, and by we I mean not just Caltech, but in higher education, because this is something that's happening all over the place in the United States. How do we make sure that in taking down the name of somebody with this problematic past, that it's not just a gesture, right? That we've done this gesture and we can pat ourselves on the back and ironically, maybe not do the harder work that you're focused on. How do we ensure mm-hmm. that this is the beginning of a process and not the end of one? So that that is definitely a, a difficult question. Um, I personally have always been a fan of history. Um, I learned just by studying history that there are a lot of times that you don't want to shy away from things. And you also don't want to sweep things under the rug. You know, you, you do want to shine a light to understand as much as you can. So, for example, I'm certainly a big fan of maybe not having monuments for people, but having displays and museums. You know, I am very much in this idea of make sure that future generations know what's happened in the past for the good and for the bad. Having a name on a building or having a monument, that's tricky because of course, as humans, we get to be very finicky. You know, it could be that one generation really appreciates someone, some idea for years and years. And then it might be that a later generation thinks of that very differently. Um, I don't really know if I have an answer in really trying to figure out how do you deal with this generation on divide. You know, for example, say here in the state of California, I know growing up, Columbus Day was a big thing. Now people have replaced Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, what I like about that, at least there's a discussion of what did it mean for a person to discover a country? And there's a question of what exactly did Christopher Columbus do? I love that from a historical point of view, because now we can delve deeper into that and just focus on the facts and what happened. Whether or not you think that he was a good person, that's a judgment call you can make later. But I do like the idea of, as a historian, really looking at that more carefully. So similarly, you know, really understanding more about Native American cultures and what do we know about the lands that are here in Southern California? You know, again, just learning a lot more about the history. But this question of whether or not we commemorate Christopher Columbus on this day or not, that I don't really have a good answer to. I just understand that generation after generation, there's going to be a different thought of that person, of these people, and that person may just fall out of favor. It might just be just that the way the generation views it. Um, I wish they even had a better answer when it really does come to, let's say, how buildings are named, especially at a place here like Pomona. I know that there are a lot of rules specifically in the state of California, about how buildings are named, how names are removed from buildings, what happens if someone gives money to a building and wants their name put up on there versus the school deciding that the name is going to be taken off. Like I do understand from a legal point of view, that's a very, very complicated thing. So all that I can say as a historian is I really just appreciate the concept of just learning as much as you can about that person that you might possibly name the building after. Well, Edre, this has been a phenomenally interesting and immersive conversation about the big questions and areas of research across your career and life. In our next conversation, we'll go all the way back to the beginning and get the story of your family origins and your childhood. So thank you so much. We'll take this up next time.